Well, welcome to HBM's Crypto Corner for Wednesday, February 15, 2023. We have a few things to talk about, so let's get started. First of all, the Keystone State still apparently has Bigfoot reports. According to this article, Bigfoot sighting reported in Pennsylvania. Detailed report made. The Class B sighting made by a former police officer was deemed credible by an investigator. Pennsylvania. A former police officer has apparently discovered something unusual in the deep wilds of the Pennsylvania woods, and Bigfoot researchers are hailing it as the latest sighting of the mythical beast. Large and unusual footprints with almost four feet between them were spotted near the town of Indiana, about 50 miles northeast of Pittsburgh. The tracks were similar to human tracks, but different, the witness said in a report made to the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. There were no shoe treads in the tracks. The man said that the tracks were in a large field that had four deer wandering near it at night. According to the BFRO, deer are the main protein source for Sasquatch. The sighting was made on December 20th and investigated and published by the BFRO in February. The group said that the man who made the report was sincere and credible. They said the tracks were nearly identical to photos taken in Lewis County, Washington in 2020. It's considered a Class B sighting, which indicates that a Sasquatch was not directly seen, but evidence was spotted. In this researcher's assessment, given the step length and the stride length of the prints, the lack of any identifi identifiable shoe tread in the prints themselves, the chronological context of the track find, is congruent to other Bigfoot tracks found elsewhere, Strongly suggests that the tracks were not human in origin, but Bigfoot in nature, BFRO wrote. Given the location of the trackway, it might come as a surprise to some that Bigfoot would be found so close to human civilization, their report went on. However, given the increasing body of anecdotal, transient, and additional evidence of Sasquatch exploiting the normal origins of human civilization, the location is not that, all that surprising. And here's the report. Happened in December of 2022. Monday, December 20th. 20th was a Tuesday of last year. I'm going to include a link to the report if you guys want to read it. Basically, I think the article did a good job summarizing the entire report. Very interesting. Not a direct sighting, but a, but a sighting of footprints. Now, of course, it could be hoax, but who knows. Has Bigfoot been photographed by a game camera in Washington State? Well, according to the Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization, yes. Let's check out the video. Here is a new game cam photo of interest. J. Louie writes us, Hi, RMSO. We used to live in Pierce County, Washington. We moved to New York due to work commitments. When we lived in Pierce, the house we lived in had a good-sized area of land at the back of the property. Me and my husband, Tom, used to set trail cams for our three young kids. We used to get some lovely wildlife and birds show up. Back in August of 2020, we checked the cameras one day and found a photo of a strange humanoid shaped figure that had been captured by one of the trail cams. Not really sure what to make of the photo. We never showed it to the kids. It is very odd and peculiar looking. It does look like a long haired humanoid shaped figure covered in hair. I wonder if it could be some kind of Yeti or Bigfoot type of being. We have upgraded our computer system. The photo was in a saved folder on the old PC. To be honest, we forgot all about it. Not seen it in ages. I thought I would send it to you guys to see what you can make of it. We found RMSO after a quick Google search and thought you guys looked like you were very open-minded. So we thought we would let you have the photo and use it and share it. If you do share it online, please don't publish my surname. We are not interested in this subject. The photo just sits in the folder on the PC unseen. We are considered deleting it for good. Let me know what you guys think. Kind regards. RMSO responds. 
Pierce County is one of the top counties in Washington for Bigfoot sightings reported. BFRO shows 83 reports. Neighboring counties have many Bigfoot reports too. Lewis County has 50, King County has 47, and Skamania has 64. Our team received several sighting reports from these areas each year, including photos, videos, and vocalizations too. Interesting trail camera photo. This does appear to be a hairy hominid of sorts. Perhaps it could be a Bigfoot individual. Well, Steve Coles has weighed in on this particular photograph. I'll show you the video that he put out here in a second. As you can see, that particular supposed trail cam photograph was actually a guy in a costume from a, from a TV series. So, once again, the Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization continues to promote hoaxes and, and, and try and claim that they're Sasquatch. Sounds to me like the Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization has a bit of a credibility problem. At least that's the way I look at it. Here's an interesting story. A group of kids come eye to eye with Bigfoot after following awful smell in forest. A group of children were startled when they came eye to eye with Bigfoot after they followed a god-awful smell which led them to the beast while on a camping trip in California. A group of children came eye to eye with Bigfoot after they followed a disturbing smell while on a camping trip. The children were spending the night at Cooks County Campground in Mendocino County, California, when they claimed to have had an interaction with Bigfoot. The area is surrounded by huge redwood trees and a dense empty forest. The Daily Star reports that the children were playing at a playground at the site when they caught whiff of a god-awful smell which led to the eight-foot-tall beast. The 1963 sighting of the mythical beast has been categorized as a Class A sighting by the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, a group of amateur investigators who keep tabs on sightings in the U.S. Class A sightings of Bigfoot meant the beast was clearly visible. This one was reported by, to the organization in 1999 by a witness whose initials are V.E., Mendo Fever, a website that features articles about Mendocino County, ran a story looking back at the sighting in 2022, 59 years after it took place. Describing the moment the children came too close to Bigfoot, the site stated that the children suddenly caught whiff of a, of a god-awful smell, a rank mixture of rotting deer carcass and skunk. The crew followed the stench with their eyes and found themselves eye-to-eye -eye with the legendary Bigfoot. Sitting near the tree line, the creature was eight feet in co tall and covered in brown hair from head to toe. The children had caught the wild man watching them play near, sitting near the base of a redwood. Over the years, there have been multiple reports of Bigfoot in the area, one of which ended in the beast allegedly killing three people on a marijuana farm in Mendocino. When it came to the camping children, this Bigfoot decided to leave them in one piece. The children studied the Sasquatch, both strangers to each other. The creature hung tight to the tree line. Most kids in those parts have been told tales of Bigfoot. This was no bedtime story Mendo Fever wrote. And then it was over. Sasquatch simply turned around and walked into the dark Redwood Forest. Multiple children confirmed the account, detailing the awful smell and the ape-like figure staring back at them. The Bigfoot Field Research Organization has collected over a dozen sightings of Sasquatch in Mendocino County. So, very interesting. If, 
well, if you if you have an area with water, food, and shelter, then you can have a Sasquatch. Water, food, and cover, I should say. Then you could have a Sasquatch. It's entirely possible. Possible Bigfoot tooth claims DNA results. A TikToker recently claimed to have found a tooth belonging to the legendary cryptid Bigfoot. Faced with a potential chance to gather scientific proof, he reached out to a lab asking how to proceed for a DNA sample. He is now claiming the lab has gotten back to him with results in a non-disclosure agreement. This was found by a fellow TikToker, which video credit is in the description. He found what he initially thought was a bone and ended up being a tooth. So he's sending it in for analysis. They told him to clean it up um, and send it in, and they would be able to conduct the research. Um, so he did all of that. The first letter that he received back was the, res the results, but they hit him with the results for the sample you sent in for analysis has been conducted. Before we go any further, as per the NDNA, we both agreed to not disclose any personal information to the party pertaining to the information in this letter. Basically, they hit him with an NDA first. That right away lets me know that this is major. This is about to be big. It's about to blow everybody's socks off and they want first dibs at it. That's typically what happens with the, when an NDNA is, is sent and it's requested first before they even go further. So I'm assuming they sign the NDNA, whatever the case may be, and then comes the result. The sample has been determined. Dental pulp has been found. Dental pulp is the soft lining part of the tooth containing nerves, arteries, um, and veins and runs deep into the jaw. So basically they're starting the confirmation that this is an actual tooth. So they, have, they have to go through stages to confirm that it's an actual tooth and not a bone. The sample has been determined dentine, which has been found. Dentine is a calcified tissue that accounts for most of the tooth. Again, just another confirmation that this is an actual tooth and it's not some other bone. The sample has been determined tooth decay has been found. Tooth decay is damage to the tooth surface during an animal. Tooth decay can lead to cavities, which are holes in your mouth. Again, this is just a confirmation that this is a tooth and not some other bone. With a combination of the results, it is determined that your sample is that of a tooth. The sample has determined DNA has been found. DNA, or uh, that acid, is a long molecule that contains our unique genetic code. This is where it gets in interesting. The sample has determined that DNA contains between 97 to 99% human DNA. The specific DNA match is unknown to any records in the international database. That right there is the smoking gun. It's human DNA, and it's an unknown human DNA, and now they want to research it further. What? The letter from the laboratory references an NDA that protects both parties from discussing any personal information such as names, addresses, phone numbers, known affiliates, or any incriminating information that will cause harm or harassment to either party. Some believe this is an indication that the news is big and the lab wants to retain control over the release of information. Others suspect the lab wished to collect money but without association with whatever results it may find. The results are interesting to be sure if they are able to be independently verified and peer-reviewed. The potential Sasquatch sample was determined to be dental pulp, which is the soft and living part of the tooth containing nerves, arteries, and veins. Confirmation that the sample is indeed a tooth is the first step in the process, and it was found to be dentine in nature. The alleged cryptid tooth was also noted to have tooth decay. After it was determined to be a tooth, it was further determined there was DNA within that could be tested. Testing returned results showing between 97% to 99% DNA, human DNA, but the specific match is unknown to any records in the international database. The determination, this determination appears to be followed by a request to analyze the physical tooth itself for the research with the bold assertion that it may be from an unknown or undocumented species followed by advising the sample not be handled or further exposed to the environment of contaminants. 
This video highlights some of the problems with collecting and analyzing evidence that can potentially prove encrypted's existence, such as finding a lab in the first place. The inclusion of an NDA is also a strange hurdle to have to overcome, and it can often put people off pursuing any of it. NDAs aren't magical documents with no restrictions, though. Quite the opposite, many are potentially unenforceable in court. NDAs were initially used to protect proprietary information or trade secrets between business parties that needed to exchange that information to work together. However, in modern times, they are often used to prevent transparency, cover up crimes, or in conjunction with non compete clauses, which prevent employees from being able to obtain work in their field if they try to seek a different employer. The good news is. Now you don't have to sign the NDA. You can just say no. If you're forced to sign a legal document against your will, that is also a crime. It could be ruled unenforceable, unenforceable in a court of law. Considering the legalities of NDAs, it doesn't seem to be in standing to have one in regards to testing a tooth for origin. Even if that origin is an undiscovered species. For everybody asking if Bigfoot is real, where are the bones? Well, they might just be in a lab buried under an NDA. The video is very interesting, and the story is very interesting as well. Could this possibly be a Sasquatch tooth? It's entirely possible. I mean, it comes back unknown. Unknown of anything in the database. So, it's very interesting. Could we have finally found the proof we've been looking for all these years? Or could there possibly be contaminants? That's the only thing I'm concerned with, is there might be contaminants. That the sample was not handled properly. So, but still, it's very interesting, very fascinating. People swear they saw Bigfoot bathing in a pond on Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island off the west coast of British Columbia in Canada is no stranger to stories of Bigfoot. Many residents there claim to have seen the hairy cryptid or heard its unearthly howls in the mist and trees. The creature is part of the rich legends of the, le of the region and is considered a sacred animal by the native people of the area. And some people may think, think they may have just, they just caught one taking a bath. The video purports to be footage caught of a bipedal Bigfoot-like creature bathing in a body of water on Vancouver Island. The video is short and shaky, which makes the definite identification tricky. In the comments, people offer a variety of theories. It's a black bear, which sometimes does stand on tiny legs. The sloping shoulders seem to support this theory. Others conclude that it's just a decaying tree stump sticking out of the water, which due to the light on the water and the shaky camera movement looks eerily like an animal torso. Honestly, either is possible. I'm leaning toward the tree stump theory myself. Even though, given the way that it is impossible to make out any real head or features in the short clip we are given. Then again, there are a lot of Bitcoin sightings in this area, so the jury is still out. It's a short video. It's entirely possible that it could be just a misidentification of a bear, or it could be a tree stump. It doesn't move, notably enough. The thing does not move.
So it could be most likely a tree stump. I mean, nice try, but <laughs> I guess it's back to the drawing board. Now here is something unique and terrifying. Mythical creature sightings in Philippines spark panic, prompt police response. Police in the Philippines are attempting to put down a panic that has erupted in the city after two girls claim to have encountered a fearsome mythical creature known as a Mananagal. According to a local media report, the curious case began last Thursday evening in the community of Telese, and when the pair of witnesses said that they had spotted something rather unusual and terrifying perched atop a house. Although details surrounding what they specifically saw are scant, the shaken young women told police that they believed the oddity to be a Menengal, which in Philippine folklore is said to be a bat-like creature seen in an artist's description above that can separate its body of the torso. Word of the strange sightings soon spread like wildfire in the community, and concerns surrounding the incident were compounded when, a few days later, it was said that a creature with the head of a pig and the body of a human had been seen in a nearby town. In an attempt to assuage the growing fears of residents, assuage the growing fears of residents, authorities went so far as to hold a press conference concerning the matter, pledging to investigate the report submitted by the witnesses who are reportedly receiving counseling following the traumatic encounter. Authorities pleaded with residents to stop sharing rumors of Mananangal sightings and instead to immediately notify police if they encounter something unusual. So, what's going on in the Philippines? Hmm, very interesting. Something unusual going on, apparently. Nick Redfern has been knocking out some interesting articles as of late. Loch Ness Monsters and Creature Seeker Ted Holiday, a fascinating story. I'm on a bit of a Nessie quest now. Today it revolves around one of the key figures in Nessie thinking, seeking, Frederick Ted Holiday. He was a fascinating person, a man who was open to the flesh and blood angle of the Nessies and also to the paranormal angle. With that said, let's get moving. It's time now for me to demonstrate the sheer extent to which exposure to Loch Ness and its attendant monsters and mysteries can majorly affect a person's mindset and opinions on the nature of what's afoot in the dark waters. We only have to take a look at the strange and ultimately tragic saga of Frederick William Holliday to see what I mean. A child of the 1920s, it was hardly surprising that Holliday should have become enthused and excited by the explosion of interest in the Loch Ness Monster in 1933. He was, after all, a 12-year-old boy at the time, one for whom, all, for whom adventures, unusual animals, and mysterious places were at the forefront of his young mind. It was not until 1962, however, that Holliday, a skilled angler, was able to make the trip of a lifetime. He did so in an old van packed with all the essentials for a Nessie hunt, such as cameras, a sleeping bag, and even fishing rods. Although one suspects that a fishing rod would hardly have been the suitable tool for reeling in a huge marauding leviathan of the deep, and quite possibly one of supernatural deadly proportions. From the outset, Holiday was of the opinion that the Loch Ness monsters were all too real. Exactly what they were, however, was an entirely different matter and something which he was unable to answer at the time. But that didn't stop him from doing his utmost to find out. It was on his very first night at the lock, camped out under the stars, that Holiday experienced something that would go on to plague him on just about each and every consecutive visit to Loch Ness. It was a dark sense of foreboding, a ghostly chill in the air, a sense of Things not being quite right, of something foul and malignant lurking just out of sight. He could practically taste it, whatever it actually was. Holiday admitted to friends and colleagues that he found this puzzling. After all, he had studied wildlife in Iraq, India, and Africa, and sometimes fairly dangerous wildlife, too. But there was something different about Loch Ness, something which unsettled Holiday and smacked of the paranormal. 
All they said of this curious situation after sunset, not a water by which to linger. The feeling is hard to define and impossible to explain. After dark, I felt that Loch Ness was better left alone. An enigma in deep waters. Holiday's instinct was on target. It was right at the stroke of midnight, no less, when he was suddenly awakened from his slumber by the loud tones of what sounded like huge waves pummeling the shore. Holiday jumped up and quickly scoured the area. There was not a boat in sight that might have explained the disturbances in the water. Nor was anything else in sight, but something had clearly disturbed the water. It's possible that the source of the commotion showed itself to Holiday only two days later. That was when Holiday was fortunate enough to encounter a monster. Dawn was breaking in Holiday as he scanned the waters, caught sight of something large and black break the surface of the lock to a height of around three feet. Then, without warning, the water churned violently and the thing plunged beneath the waves. Holiday was ex as excited as he was shocked. He also had that earlier sense of foreboding overwhelm him again, much to his concern and puzzlement. Incredibly, he was of the opinion that the beast he saw was in the order of 45 feet in length, a true monster indeed. Despite, despite spending untold numbers of days of the, of the, at the lock in the months and immediate years ahead, Holiday was not to have a second encounter until 1965, or rather, encounters. That's right, in 65, Holiday caught sight of a nasty on two occasions. And on both occasions, he was blessed with a view of the upturned, boat-like back of the beast. Incredibly, Holiday was already formulating a theory for what the Loch Ness Monsters Act really were. <coughs> for Ted Holiday, the plesiosaur, giant eel, and salamander theories were flawed and lacking in substance. He came to the somewhat unusual and certainly unique scenario that the Nessies were gigantic versions of everyday slugs. The biggest problem with Holiday's theories was that it was beset by issues that made it most unlikely to have merit. For example, the specific kind of invertebrate that Holiday had in mind, Telemonstrum, only grew to lengths of, ground, of around lengths of 14 inches. On top of that, it lived solely in the muddy landscapes of Pennsylvania, USA. Oh, and one more thing that should be noted. It went extinct around 300 million years ago. None of these seemingly important points appeared to bother Holiday in the slightest, who continued to pursue his theory with a great deal of enthusiasm. Such was the level of gusto that Holiday mustered. By 1968, he had written an entire book on the subject of his pet theory. Its title was The Great Orm of Loch Ness, Orm being a centuries-old term meaning worm. There's no doubt that Holiday made a brave case for the theory that the Nessies were massive inver invertebrates. The problem was that his book was entirely based on supposition and speculation. Nevertheless, he did make the valid point that whatever the Nessies might be, they were almost certainly responsible for the many and varied le legends of dragons seen roaming the United Kingdom hundreds of years earlier. In that sense, Holiday believed the Orms of Loch Ness were merely one colony of a creature that was far more widespread in times long gone. On that issue, he was almost certainly correct. Loch Ness is far from being alone when it comes to the matter of monsters in the United Kingdom. The age-old sagas of the Linton Worm and the Wyvern of North Wales Lynn Swinch Lake being famous classic examples. Holiday's book became a big talking point amongst the Nessie Secret community, specifically because he was positing such an unconventional scenario and <coughs> essentially giving the middle finger to the champions of the Please You Soar, Giant Eel, and Salamander scenario. It was right around the time his book was published, however, that Ted Holiday found his world turned upside down and filled to the brim with weirdness, which was rather ironic given how much time and effort had gone into the writing and production of his book. And that weirdness only increased exponentially, and to where filled to the brim was replaced by absolutely overflowing. Even though Ted Holiday 
sincerely believed that the Tilly Malmstrom Gregarium theory had merit, and while he wasn't able to shake off that deep, foreboding feeling that there was something more to the Loch Ness Monsters, something which, rather paradoxically, implied that they were flesh and blood animals but once possessed of supernatural qualities. It was a feeling that would ultimately become a full-blown unhealthy obsession, and one that pretty much dictated the rest of his short life and research. By the time The Great Orm of Loch Ness was published, Holiday had not only been to the lair of the Nessies on numerous occasions, he had also had the opportunity to speak to many witnesses to the beast. In doing so, he noticed the most curious and even unsettling pattern. There were, more, there were far more than a random number of reports on record where eyewitnesses to the creatures had tried to photograph them, only to fail miserably. As time progressed, it became abundantly obvious to Holiday that this was not down to nothing stranger than chance. When an excited soul on the shore began to grab, went to grab their camera, the beast would sink beneath the waves. When someone even just thought about taking a picture, the, the monster would vanish below. On other occasions, the cameras would malfunction. Pictures would come out blank or fogged. It was as if the Nessies were dictating and manipulating the situations in which the witnesses found themselves. That is exactly what Holiday came to believe was going on. By 1969, his life was dominated by weird synchronicities, meaningful coincidences in simple terms, something which led Holiday to question both his sanity and even the, the, even the very nature of reality itself. What had begun as an exciting hunt for an unknown animal was now rapidly mutating into something very different, something dangerous and supernatural. It's worth noting that 1968 was an important year in Nessie history for another reason. That was when Professor D. Gordon Tucker from the University of Birmingham, England, achieved something notable at Loch Ness. He offered his help to the Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau, which undertook on-site investigations at Loch Ness that at one point had more than 1,000 members. Specifically, Tucker provided the Nessie hunters with a prototype sonar device that had the ability to sweep underwater to a distance of no less than 2,500 feet. Significantly, when deployed in the below surface level at Urquhart Bay's Temple Pier, the sonar tracked a number of approximately 20-foot-long objects traveling from the lower levels of the lock to the higher levels and vice versa. They were never formally identified. 97 1979 was also the year that Ted Holliday passed away from a heart attack at a prematurely young age. He was only in his late 50s. Holliday's final book was The Goblin Universe. The publicity for the book stated the following. F.W. Ted Holliday addresses this issue with some startling revelations. In The Goblin Universe is found the world of the mind. The greater universe. This is a place of psychic phenomena, prophecies, ghosts, poltergeists, UFOs, the men in black, dragons, Bigfoot, and a lot of this monster. This amazing world is explored through Ted Holiday's personal experiences and a search for a unified theory of the paranormal. As Colin Wilson points out in the introduction, we must use our intuition as Holiday did in order to see into the Goblin Universe, the realm of unexplained illusions. The Goblin Universe examines a wide range of fascination, occult phenomena, and explores the technologies we may use to expand our native psi abilities. In what sense is this a real world? Ted Holliday spent the greater part of his life investigating such things and gained valuable first-hand experience of natural phenomena, which enabled him to develop groundbreaking ideas about what they really are. Throughout history, mankind has been confronted by things that just do not fit with conventional notions of reality. Yet scientists have completely failed to come to grips with the mass of evidence that has emerged. Here, at last, is a reasoned argument that offers a new way of thinking about phenomena, the foundations of a new science. Although Holliday, particularly in the 1960s, focused on the Nessies being unknown animals, things didn't stay that way. By the 1970s, his views changed notably. 
By the 1970s, his views have changed notably. And you only have to take a look at the blur from the Goblin Universe. By that time, Holiday was someone who was on a par with John A. Keel of the Mothman Prophecies. Of course, there's no way to find out where Holiday might have gone had he not died young. I recommend one and all to read the Goblin Universe. It's a book that is massively different from Holiday's previous works, including the Dragon and the Disc. That covers multiple different objects, subjects, and scenarios. It was a tragedy that Holiday was lost. But what he left behind him was, and still is, without doubt, priceless. The one sad thing in all this is that Ted Holiday never got resolved, the mystery of the Loch Ness Monster. Got to resolve, the mystery of the Loch Ness Monster. At least not on this level, but maybe now he knows the answers he's strived for in the real world. So, very fascinating. A fascinating look at a guy who apparently was quite interested in Nessie and had sightings of it. Also developed an interesting theory about them. Another article by Nick Redfern, The Loch Ness Monsters. We know they live, but what are they? That's the question I'm asking today. Indeed, there is a handful of theories for what the monsters could be. We'll begin with the fascinating possibility that was put forth by, forward by F.W. Ted Holliday, who was a significant figure in the 1960s and 1970s. A child in the 1920s, it was hardly surprising that Holliday should have become enthused and excited by the explosion of interest in the monster in 1933. He was, after all, a 12-year-old boy at the time, one for whom adventures, unusual animals, and mysterious places were at the forefront of his young mind. It was not until 1962. Okay, this is kind of reiterating the, the previous article for some reason. Okay, here we go. Here's... Uh, it's... Essentially, there was stuff from the previous article. Roy Mackle, also fascinated by the Loch Ness Monster, commented on a particular theory that has relevance to one specific aspect of Hugh Gray's photo, the turtle-like head. He noted correctly that the leatherback turtle can grow to impressive sizes and weights, up to 10 feet in length and weights of over a ton. Problematic, however, is the fact that leatherback turtles do not have long tails. And, like all turtles, they give birth on land. This latter issue effectively rules out turtles as being the guilty parties, since, by now, at least one of the millions of people who have visited Loch Ness would surely have stumbled on at least one sizable egg of such an immense beast. A far more thought-provoking theory has been suggested by Steve Plambeck. He suspects the Nessies may be giant salamanders. He has diligently studied the gray photo. The salamander theory actually dates back to the earliest years of Nessie lore, but certainly no one has dug quite so deeply and dedicatedly as Planbeck. Salamanders are amphibians that are noted for their long tails, but blunt heads and short limbs in which, in the case of the Chinese giant salamander, can reach lengths of six feet. But is it possible that some salamanders could grow much larger, even to the extent of 15 to 25 feet? <coughs> Incredible? Yes. Implausible? Maybe not. Steve Planbeck says that the Nessies are likely to be creatures that derive their oxygen from the water. Add to that the distinct lack of large numbers of reports and what we have, believes Planbeck, is some form of creature that spends the bulk of its time on the bed of the lock or at least very near to it. There is, however, another theory, one which goes right back to some of the earliest reports of the Losses of Loch Ness. It's the theory that the Nessies of the 1930s were supernatural shapeshifters, one and all, and just like their counterparts of centuries earlier. Let's look at the facts as we know them. In 1880, Duncan McDonald had a terrifying eye-to-eye -eye encounter with something that resembled a giant goat-sized frog. There was the matter of that tusked beast seen in the waters of the River Ness in 1932 by Miss K. McDonald. 
Lieutenant McP Fordyce described seeing an animal that walked like an elephant that looked like a combination of a very large horse and a camel, and which was shaggy in appearance. Arthur Grant's sighting was of something more akin to a plesiosaur. Mr. and Mrs. George Spicer encountered a creature that had a jerky, wormy gait, and which provoked both nightmares and what practically sounds like post-traumatic stress disorder. And Hugh Gray photographed an animal with a beak-like, turtle-style head. It had absolutely no neck of any significance whatsoever, and its stubby appendages were actually were clearly not sizable plesiosaur-like flippers of the type Arthur Grant was sure he saw. Nor were they anything that might have allowed the creature to walk on land like an elephant. It must be noted that in the early 1930s, and in a period when the technology was developing in leap is, leaps and bounds, the mysterious tales of body-morphing water horses and kelpies held nowhere near the sway they did in centuries previously. Times were changing, but the day eventually came, as we shall see later, when those old terrors and superstitions surrounding all things of a kelpie nature eventually resurfaced and took hold of fear-filled minds and souls. And something else resurfaced at Loch Ness in the 1930s. Now, how about giant eels? It's not a bad theory, but it does have its flaws, such as eels don't have necks. Around 10 p.m. on May 26, 2007, Gordon Holmes filmed, well, something in Loch Ness. It was something that turned him into an overnight media sensation, albeit a brief sensation. The day in question was dominated by heavy rain, but which cleared as the eating arrived, allowing Holmes to get clear footage of what looked like some kind of animal moving at a significant rate of knots in the waters of Loch Ness. The specific location from where all the action was captured was a parking area on the A82 Road, just a couple of miles from Drum the Drocket. Not only that, Holmes estimated as he excitedly watched and filmed that the creature was around 14 meters in length, which, if true, effectively ruled out everything known to live in the inland waters of the British Isles. Holmes, a lab technician, caught the attention of not just the British media, but also the likes of NBC News and CNN. He and his near-priceless film were, quick, were quickly big news. Holmes said, when the media ascended upon him in absolute droves, that he could scarcely believe what he was seeing. It was a large, black-colored animal that had a length of around 45 feet. His first thought was, giant eel. Holmes told the media of the, meal, of the eel theory, they have serpent-like features and they may explain all the sightings in Loch Ness over the years. Long-time Nessie seeker Adrian Schein was moved to comment in a fairly positive fashion. Although describing himself as a skeptic on matters concerning the monsters, Schein was certainly no debunker of this latest case. Indeed, he said of Gordon Holmes' film that it was some of the best footage I have seen. Schein was careful to add that while Holmes might have filmed a living beast, there was always a possibility that the whole thing could be explained away by waves but it might well have been a case of seeing something we want to see, and then interpreting it as a monster, whatever it really was. It wasn't long before monster hunters turned their attentions away from the Loch Ness Monster and in the direction of Holmes himself, something which provoked huge controversies when certain eye-opening and eyebrows-raising issues came to light. Cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman discovered that Holmes had a biographical page in the Department of Archaeological Sciences at Bradford University, in which he was described as holding the position of media and IT technician. Nothing wrong with that, of course, but there was more to come. <clears throat> in addition, Coleman demonstrated that Holmes had written a number of books, including The Complex Creation of All Universes, 2000 BC, A Neolithic Solstice Odyssey, and Merlin's Meteorite. Rather intriguingly, Holmes himself said that this then most recent book, his most recent book, Trice Visualization, describes the sort of medical condition I have for visualizing a sore frame from a dream whilst being conscious. They were images not that typically lasted for under a minute 
in which occurred every two or three months. Did Holmes' seemingly psychic skills give him the ability to see and even film one of the supernatural essays on that fateful night in May 2007? It's a controversial theory we should not rule out. 1933 was certainly the year which birthed Nessie. Of that, there is no doubt. One year earlier, however, there was a very strange occurrence in Loch Ness. It's one that is very often overlooked or ignored. The reason why, you will see, is very easy to fathom. It is the extreme odds in terms of the description of the creature with other reports. It is not, therefore, sent well with many Nessie investigators. Too bad. High strangeness is at the very heart of this book. Something which ensures the case gets the airing it richly deserves. The witness was a Lieutenant McP. Fordyce, and the date was April 1932, two months after James Cameron signing at Shrone Point. At the time, Fordyce was living in the English country of Kent, but along with his fiancée traveled by car to Aberdeen, Scotland to attend the family wedding. Given that the drive was such a long one, instead of simply driving through immediately all the way back home, Fordyce decided to show his fiancée a bit of his homeland. The young lovers in a late evening, a romantic dinner, <clears throat> took a stroll through the town and encountered a band of men playing bagpipes. It was a perfect slice of ancient Scottish tradition, one that Fordyce's girl would never forget. There was something else she would never forget, too, neither would Fordyce. The following morning, the pair decided to hit the road running and hopefully make the journey back to Kent in good time. It was a bright and sunny day for the drive. The drivers took them past Loch Ness as far as Foyers, at which point they turned into, onto the road to Fort William, away from the loch side and into the heart of the wooded areas that dominate certain portions of the loch. According to Fordyce's memory, he was driving at around 25 miles per hour at the time, when he and his fiance were shocked and amazed by the sight of a large animal appearing from the dense woods and then making its way across the road, a distance of around 450 feet. He added that the beast moved like an elephant, but appeared to be something akin to a strange combination of a camel and a horse. Even to it having a camel-like hump on its back and a small heap, small head positioned on a long neck, displaying welcome gumption, the adventurous Fordyce stopped the car, jumped out, and decided to pursue the creature on foot. As he got closer, but still kept a respectful distance, just in case the creature turned violent, Fordyce could now see that the rear of the animal was gray in color and had wild and shaggy hair, while his long neck reminded him very much of the trunk of an elephant. Unfortunately, and surely to the consternation of monster seekers everywhere, Fordyce left his camera in the car. He then realized that the somewhat precarious position he was in, stalking a large and unknown animal in the woods, and decided that pursuing the thing was perhaps not such a good idea after all. <coughs> a worm-slaying, armored knight of old, Fordyce was most definitely not. By Fordyce's own admission, he and his fiancée spoke about the amazing event for the entire journey back home. The only theory they could come up with was that the animal had escaped from a zoo. He admitted that he was sure that the large creature would easily be seen by others quickly caught. As history has shown, the Nessies remain as elusive today as they were back in 1932, when Fordyce's one-in-a-million chance encounter <coughs> occurred. Aside from confiding in family members, Fordyce stayed silent on his sighting until 1990 when, finally, as an old man, he contacted the media and his story became public knowledge. The camel-like and even hairy descriptions of the beast are, admittedly, <clears throat> at odds with many other reports, but not all. As was Fordyce's observation that it had an elephantine gait. The latter comment suggests that the creature worked, walked on legs <clears throat> rather than moving around using flipper-like appendages, which are so very often reported in Nessie encounters. Whatever Fordyce encountered, it remains practically unique in terms of its physical appearance. As for today, Loch Ness Monster Authority, Rowan Watson, <coughs> has also waded into the controver this controversy and admits that I'm a bit partial to a fish-like amphibian or amphibian-like fish theory myself. 
Of course, we might be looking at something totally unknown. The mystery remains a mystery. So, two very fascinating articles about this monster by Nick Redfern. Good stuff. Finally, I want to highly recommend everybody see On the Trail of Bigfoot, Last Frontier. Seth Breedlove and Small Town Monsters went to Alaska last year and the year before and found some interesting stuff, some interesting witness accounts. And it's really terrific. It's a great documentary movie slash movie. I highly recommend it. That's good there for this week. Well, thank you for tuning in. You guys are the heart of the show. I always say that, but I always mean it. And I'll continue to do this as long as you guys want me to. And hey, until next week, y'all be good or be good dead. This is me, Jim, Spectre Corner.